They forgot to play that in the first service. That was really good. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Just to, by way of introduction, it's really great to be back uh, in the life of this great local church. Thank you for your ongoing commitment to the city and the apostolic work that's going on around the world. You are an amazing community of people. And I just thank the elders and the team for, yeah, for the heart that they have for the wider work of God. Just to say, Steve and Jackie are down in Cape Town, uh, send their love doing the two oceans. Of course, that's just Jackie. I mean, you, you figured that out, right? <laughs> uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, Belito are opening their building today. City Hill Belito. Ah, what a wonderful thing, eh? <laughs> and uh, God has really, really been good to them. And, um, and lastly, um, we, since we were here last with you, two things have happened. One, two more church plants have kind of kicked off in the life of, of, of Durban, which I think is really, really exciting. And we have become grandparents to another grandson. Hey, a really beautiful boy. And we are just super excited about that. So it's always good to be here and to catch up with home and with what feels so much like family to us. It really is a privilege. It is a privilege for me to preach into this series that you are on. Um, and when I was given the text, I realized that Steve did the text after me, and I'm jumping back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 25, and just preaching on the, the, the goats and the, and the sheep last week. I mean, what a great thing. And for me to be able to pick it up, let me pick it up in Matthew 25 and verse 14, in this magnificent discourse of Jesus' stories that he tells. It says in verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. I'm, I'm going to jump a little. So don't worry, the, the whole thing, it says in verse 19, now after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with him. You know the story, I'm sure many of you. In verse 24, he, all, he who had received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you, had, you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him and said, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I had not sown and gathered where I had not scattered seed. In verse 30, we see the result of that. It says, and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness in the place that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a beautiful story that Jesus tells and I want to speak about a thought or a thing that God really sparks in me out of this particular story. But the first comment I want to make about the passage, that this passage cannot be about money and about gifts. I know it's been preached like that many times. It's about your talents and your money and your gifts. It can't be about that because if it was, the result of misappropriation of those two things does not get you cast out into outer darkness over the handling of your finance and your gifts, right? So it can't be about that. Uh, we can kind of assume. The story must really have a hidden message about the gospel then. Must be some story in there because a rejection of the gospel produces that kind of result that uh, Jesus speaks about in the story. But the thing that kind of jumps out of the pages at me is this, you knew. This, this servant speaks, says, you knew what I was like. Jesus says, and the servant says, I knew you to be a hard master and do this and require things. And immediately we understand that when he makes that statement, he doesn't really know. It's an indictment against him that he makes a statement that says, I knew what you were like, but actually he has no clue what he's like. And the challenge really for me, for many, many Christians sitting in the life of local churches, is that we, we have a very transactional relationship with God. That's why I'm speaking about transacting with God today. That's the title of my message. But our view is very transactional. We have this idea that somehow if we do the right thing or say the right thing, then the blessing of God will come to us. If I kind of pull the hand of the slot machine, do the right thing, then you know, everything will spin for me, it'll all happen. And equally, if I, you know, 
If I, if I, I had no time with the Lord this morning, I never prayed, I, I had a rash morning and I kicked the dog on the way out the door and I made my way to church, well, we can't have God's blessing on me now. Equally, we have a problem both ways. We kind of think, I don't deserve blessing or I'm doing all the right things, so I must have blessing. It's this transactional view that many Christians sit with in the, like, in the life of local churches. And I'm gonna highlight for you the idea that it is so critical that we know him, that we catch his eye, that we see him, that we know him beyond the idea that we have a transactional interaction with God all the time. I've observed a problem in churches, and that is that provision and blessing seems directly linked to obedience. In other words, if I obey, I do the right thing, then I can expect God to bless me. If I need healing, I read scriptures, I do the right thing, and then God will heal me. And, and, and the challenge with all of those things is that, of course, if we're doing all the right things and we don't have the result, well, then we have a problem. Pick, pick money as a good example. We say, well, I'm a tither, I'm a giver. I give my money into the life of the church, and, and, uh, and yet I'm... I'm living without and it's a struggle and it's a battle and I'm doing all the right things, but I'm not seeing the result or the consequence or the thing that I really feel needs to happen now because I'm a giver in the life of the church. Well, it, 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 the problem is that there's really only two faults here, possible faults, and both are a problem. If I'm doing all the right thing and I'm not seeing the response, the problem then is that the fault can then only be God's. That's a problem. I can't, I can't push. I'm doing everything that's right and I'm not seeing the blessing. Then the fault must be God's. God's not coming through on his deal with me. Well, we all know that not to be true. And I need to nail that down right away. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? God sticks to his word. So if I'm not seeing provision for something that I'm doing and it's, the problem isn't with God and you may say, well, the problem is not with me, then where's the problem? Well, there really only is a third option possible and that is that our teaching and our theology is wrong. Something's happened to the way we see the scripture. So if God's not wrong, I'm not wrong, then somehow the things we've been taught over the years were slightly skewed, and I want to correct that today. I want to make an attempt at making an adjustment and a correction in you because our theology and our thinking is so transactional, we grow up with such transactional thinking that it's almost our default setting. I'll tell you how that happens to us. Growing up in our normal homes, everything has consequence. You know, we tell our children, touch that hot plate, you're going to burn your finger. Do that, you're going to get a hiding. I don't know whether I'm allowed to say hiding these days, but, uh, you, you, you know, I mean, but you know, there's going to be consequences for stuff you do. That's how we grow up our children. That's how we all grow up. We know that there's consequence. But, and here's the problem, the actual consequence of your sin, not not the physical consequence. If I go and steal from someone, I'm going to have a physical, a practical consequence in this world that the police are gonna come find me, they're gonna lock me up, and I'm going to pay a price for stealing the money. But the consequence of my sin before God is completely removed from me. Because it was taken in Jesus Christ. I, I, I mean, I could stop right there and say, guys, go think about that for the afternoon. And there should be, it, it just, it, it's, it's phenomenal to think. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 in the New Living Translation says, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. He does not count our sin against us. That means our past, our present, and our future sin sits upon his son upon the cross. And he paid a price for it. And all the sin, all the struggles and all the battles of your life have been paid for in Jesus Christ. The consequence spiritually of your sin is gone from your life. 
Who? It's why he calls us sons and daughters. We belong to him. He pays a price for it. But here's the deal. We often think about man's effort in the process. What contribution must I make? What thing must I do to receive this great reward? Because we think transactionally. I must come to God. I must give my life. I surrender all. And, and we, I know I'm saying it's not a great song. I love that song. But if we sing it with the mindset that somehow I've got to come and give all my stuff, then God will do all his stuff. It's a transactional mindset that causes trouble for us because we do not see the face of God. We don't see relationship with him. We see the transaction. And when we do the wrong thing, we expect the wrong thing. We do the right thing. We expect that God would do the right thing for us. And it's a challenge in our lives. I think maybe helpful to understand covenant. You see, because a Jewish person would grow up in a Jewish family, understand covenant well. I don't think we understand it well. We kind of think vaguely about something. But in the context of the scriptures, it's kind of two people. Like Phil and I would make covenant with one another. We'd cut our hand. We'd you know, mix blood in the old way. And, and I would say that everything that is mine is yours, and everything that is yours is mine. That's a good deal for me. <laughs> and, but my life is yours, and your life is mine. By the way, as believers, aren't we covenanted together in some way, anyway? Well, I'm just saying, because that's a bit of a thing. But anyway, so, so we're in covenant together, and, and that works here. But then God chooses to make covenant with man, and he takes Abraham this man, and he, he says, let's make covenant together. Now, it gets a bit gory, I'm sorry, but, but the, the picture in the Old Testament was important because the picture says something about us. And so Abraham, God says to Abraham, I want you to cut all these animals, and he cuts the animals in half, and he lies the carcasses out on the side of a little gully, and the animals are lying there on the side, and, and, and then the idea is that God and Abraham would kind of link up, and they would walk through the blood, and the blood would be on their soles and their feet, and they would be covered, and everything that is God's would be Abraham's, and everything that is Abraham's would be God's. And so, oh, that sounds like a good idea. No, it's not at all a good idea. Because God says, Abraham, I can't have your involvement at all. He says, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you to sleep. Because I cannot have you. I cannot have you turn around and say, oh, oh, I did. I, I'm, you know, mm. Your arm did not save you, sir. He saved you. Can't have your muddy hands on my stuff can't have you fiddle around with the thing that God wants to do. So he puts Abraham to sleep. He's sleeping and God walks with himself through the blood and he says, I commit that all that is mine is sleeping Abraham's and all that is yours is mine, but everything that was Abraham's was God's already anyway. Everything he had was from God. So God makes covenant with himself that everything that is his is man's, yours. We could stop again. You want to think about that for the afternoon? Because God says, I will even give my life. Even my life is not my own. I will give my life for you that you may live. The idea, the heart of the scriptures. But here's the thing. See, God cannot tolerate. Why he puts Abraham to sleep? Because he cannot tolerate man's sweat on his sacrifice. Can't have man's effort messing up the process. That somehow man's effort got engaged and I did my thing and then God did he. No, he cannot have man's sweat on his sacrifice. This is what it says. He was so particular about it that even the priests were not allowed to sweat on the sacrifice. And here's the scripture. It says, they shall have in Ezekiel 44, and they shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen undergarments around their waist. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. Why? Because God says, I don't want you to sweat on my stuff. Can't have your effort. Pollute my sacrifice. Can you see the picture? Can you see Jesus coming? 
This is all, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's my effort. The problem with many Christians is they sit with a transactional mindset because it's how we grow up. And they think somehow, you know, a little bit of sweat equity from me will produce God's, do some stuff for me. And God says, mm -mm, I don't need your sweat. In fact, your sweat's gonna mess with my sacrifice. Your effort's gonna mess this up and you're not gonna understand the relationship that I long to have with you if you keep thinking you gotta sweat over it. He calls us into sonship, into new covenant. Genesis 3:19. by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. In other words, part of the curse is God says you gotta work for it. You've got to work for your bread. You've got to work for your money. You've got to get a job. You've got to do stuff because you've got to work for your stuff. But when it comes to his work, salvation, life with him, he says, it's all for you. I cannot have you sweat on it. In fact, he, he emphasizes it in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter four, verse nine. He says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, just as God did from his. We have rested from our works. You, you, may, you may rightly ask in this meeting, Peter, what about obedience then? Don't worry, I'll come back to it in a moment. About obedience. I haven't forgotten. God woke me up early one morning, late last year, and says, did you know, Peter, that the ands and the ifs, the ands and the ifs of the scriptures are not equal signs? I don't know why I'd always make them equal signs. Matthew chapter six, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I don't know why in my mind, because I'm so transactional in my thinking, I've always made that an equal sign that says, okay, if I, if I seek God, then I can expect all this stuff to be added to me. But what we miss, the intention of the scripture, and this is what the Lord is calling us to, what we miss, the intention is that he is the prize. Not the stuff. The things, the consequence, the results. He is the prize. He, we need to be captured by him. First and foremost. It's about seeking him. Him being the prize. And all these things will be added to you. You must say, well, you know, what, what, what about all those things then? Well, this is what I want to say. If we look at the, the covenant of Abraham in the Old Testament, you may say, well, what, what curses came along with the process? You know, I mean, obedience, yes. What curses then? Well, there weren't any in the Abrahamic covenant. Just blessing. See, Deuteronomy 28, 2 puts it like this. It says, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice, if, troublesome if, if you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. In other words, if you are captivated by me, if I am your prize, watch what happens in your life. I will surprise you. It's, this, it's almost like as I walk with him, as, I'm, as I seek his face, what happens is the blessing of God, and Con says, don't be crude, don't say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> I do every time. <laughs> it's just it's like a slap you on the back of the head. It catches up with you, just kind of, and you go, whoa. The blessing of God just kind of overtaking me. I'm surprised. Isn't it great for God's people to constantly be surprised by the blessing of God that worship springs out of our lives? Because as we walk with him, seek him and his face, what happens is the blessing of God just keeps coming up around us, slapping us on the back of the head and, and surprising us. It's a wonderful picture of what covenant is. Instead of this idea that I take step or I will obey, and where is it? And then I will do this and, you know, I'm, I've got, I'm praying every day and I'm seeking God every morning. And why am I not healed? Constantly living with this transactional mindset that holds you away from true and real relationship with God. Blessing, you see, is in God's hands. James the apostle speaks about going through various trials and yet seeing God in James 1, 2, it says, and count it all joy, my brothers, 
when you meet various trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. In other words, as you walk with him through trials and struggles, he makes you perfect and you will lack nothing. It just comes up around you. Kind of surprise, whoa. And worship becomes part of your life. The challenge for most of God's people, probably a large portion of God's people, is that we sit with such transactional views in our heads that we think, hey, I did my thing I want you to know that I, I, I sit most mornings, I, I did it this morning as well, and, and I didn't pray much this morning. Or read the scriptures, I send an SMS, and I actually sent it out early uh, by mistake. I sent it out to all the pastors around there, but I, I didn't realize I'd send it at quarter past five. I normally wait till six. So I just send an apology a little later. Um, and, and, and I'm just something that the Lord spoke to me, and I'm just kind of hanging. So, well, Pete, you know, where's your stuff? Where's the, you know, where's the things you're meant to do here? What I'm meant to do is find joy from him. What I'm meant to do is find life from him. And too many of God's people constantly have this thing, oh, I'm reading and therefore I'm that much, and I'm thinking and I'm doing my thing. and I'm, it, it loses life for you. Something is lost. And for many of God's people, that's lost. Why don't you find a place again of sitting with him, of enjoying his presence and life instead of this transactional thing that goes on for you? We are his. The power of the idea in the scriptures is that we are his. We are his sons and daughters. Paul backs up this idea that in due season, the blessing will come. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. See, the gap between obedience and provision and the gap sometimes really messes with us. You know, some 11 odd years ago, God, Karin, God said to Corin and I, give all the money away from the sale of your house. Oh, hey, hey uh, yeah, that's something. And, 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 but it was quite clear, and so, so we did. And, and 10 odd years later, we buy a piece of property, and, and we're just, in obedience to what God says, we're just buying this piece of property, and suddenly, it, it just comes all around us. Yes, that, and then somebody, and then a thing, and somebody remembers a guy got saved in our ministry 35 years ago, a young man, gets saved, sits in London, doing home renovations. He sends me a mail. I don't know, he had my mail. Sends me a mail. So listen, I remember. The Lord woke me up and said to me that you are building. I hope you're building, he writes. A house. He says, you are building and I need to bless you. He sends me a thousand pounds, 23,000 rand. A thousand pounds, a lot. And I'm thinking, it just, you know, I'm, I'm just doing my thing. And, whoo, Ten years of nothing. Can you imagine so, well, hey, you know, I pulled the handle. What's going on now? How many years must I wait? God knows the timing of your life. He knows the process of what you need. He knows the timing when he needs to release things because that's how it works with him. Don't grow weary doing good. I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna do what you're not meant to do in a big audience like this, but I'm going to leave the stage and I'm gonna preach from back there. So you're gonna to have to turn your head and those upstairs, you're gonna to have to like see through the grids. But I'm, I'm here. I'm trying to see, can I still see the back guy? Nearly. There we go, I can't walk any further. All right. In the scriptures, there's a story about Abraham. I wanna talk about obedience. Because we really mess that up many times. We think obedience has a consequence and a thing and God must do his thing, I obey. But we misunderstand obedience. And I wanna show it to you. I've asked Steph to stand, and he's standing over there on the other side, right across from me in the other aisle. And, and Abraham gets this word from the Lord. Sacrifice your son of promise. Can you imagine getting that word? The very promise that God has now worked into your life says, go and give him, kill him. First of all, you think, it'd be very easy to stand here and say, well, that's not the Lord. That's for sure. 
I mean, God could not be giving the promise and then taking it away again. I, that's definitely not, you know, I rebuke you, devil. But obedience is important. I want to show you why obedience is important. Because he receives this word from the Lord. And they have a mountain they've got to go to. So they begin to move. And, and, and Steph is moving with me. They begin to move towards the mountain. As they walk walking towards the mountain, the Bible says this, that he's walking with his boy, Isaac. And Isaac's carrying the wood. I mean, he's not a, he's not a kid kid. Huh? He's a strapping young man. He's carrying the wood because the father's a bit old. And so he's got the wood on him. And he's carrying the wood along towards the mountain. And up they go. And, and they're halfway kind of there up the mountain. And, and Isaac stops and says, hey, dad, hey. Where's the sacrifice? You know, where's the, where's the thing we've got we to sacrifice? He's got a concern, rightly so. Says, and Abraham uses these words. He says, oh, no, 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 don't worry. The Lord will provide. And off they go. They keep walking along. They get to the top of the mountain, the two of them, and the Lord clearly says, it's time to sacrifice your son. They build the altar with the, the boy sits on top. He ties him down. He, he's, he's, got the, he's got the knife raised. The angel stops him. And, and immediately the Lord speaks to him and says, look, see, there's a provision, a ram that's come up the same mountain on the other side. As Abraham walks forward in obedience, the provision of God is coming up the other side of the mountain. See, obedience is not about provision. Obedience is about responding to God so he can reveal his provision. But we make it an equal transaction. We think, whoop, I obey, God must provide. No, obedience is about me moving. And when I move, God's provision comes at the moment and the time designed by him. The ram is in the thicket and is revealed to me in the moment I get to the point where the sacrifice needs to be made. I want you to see something. It's not that obedience is unimportant. It's just not what you think it is. And your relationship's been so dependent upon obedience. Oh, you know, I'm not healed because I'm not obeying stuff and, and I did too much stuff and I did this and I did that and shoo, I can expect God to be unhappy with me. What's the matter with you? You're a son and a daughter of the living God. Walk with him. His face, his life is what we seek. Obedience carries us to the provision of God. I want to end with a simple story that Jesus tells. And he says, there were two boys. Remember, it's Jesus telling the story. It's not just anybody. Jesus tells the story. He says, there are two boys. The one boy wants his dad dead. So oh, he didn't say that. No, he wanted his inheritance early. Basically, his wish his dad was dead. So I want my inheritance. Give it to me. He takes his inheritance and he goes, Jesus' words. And go and spends the inheritance on loose living. I mean, you can put your own imagery to that, but it ain't pretty. While the boy is spending his inheritance on loose living out there and eventually lands up in a pigsty, what happens back at home? This is what the scripture says. The father, Jesus telling the story, stands every day and waits for who? His son to return. I think we miss it. We get so consumed with this transactional idea that I'm doing and then I can't expect and stuff. God's, the Father's waiting for the Son to come back. You're a son, a daughter of the living God. That's who you are. I want, I want to ask you a simple question. Who made you a son? Did you make yourself a son? Scripture is quite clear that he made you a son. It was a miracle. He, in fact, the picture of the Old Testament is that while he made you a son, you were fast asleep. You had no contribution at all. He says, I will make you a son. You are mine. Question I have for you, for those of you that are sitting vacillating in and out, and I'm in trouble, I've done the wrong thing. Ah! You have no power there. There's no power to overcome anything when you have that mindset. But when you have that struggle, I'm here to say to you, who unsuns you? There's only one person that unsuns you. 
That's the one who made you a son. And he committed himself to make you a son and a daughter of himself. The power of that idea. There's another thing you can go and digest for the afternoon. That seems, I am his. See, the problem with the two boys, the one boy wanted the father dead and have his stuff. The second boy wanted much the same because he comes along at the end and says, hey, you know, the son's returned now. Why have you, I've worked and slaved in your house and you've never given me anything. Problem with both boys, they both had the father's hands in their heads. The problem with transactional Christianity is that we're looking at the father's hands and not his face. And when you become so transactional, if I do this and then this, and if I go here and they say, if I pray enough, if I do enough, if I read enough, if I wait enough, if I give enough, then I can expect. It's not that obedience is unimportant, but obedience moves you to where God can reveal his blessing. It is not a transaction that you have with God because God is not transactional. He gives and gives and gives and makes you a son and makes you a daughter and says you are mine. Last scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter, Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. This scripture must have been read so many times over the last 10, 15 years in this nation. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. The Lord said to me, the problem with scriptures like that for many people is that they think transactionally. So we've got to humble ourselves more. Oh, come on, come on, church. More humility, more prayer, more connection with me. Come on, more. Remember, God says, hey, 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 hey. Can't have your sweat on my stuff. It's not how it works. So it's not about me doing more and humbling myself more. And then God will heal our land. If we pray more and get more intense, <laughs> Uh, 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 uh. What does it say? If you seek my face, if you see me, you see, the key to everything is seeing his face, seeing his life, that the relationship and everything that we have is to discover what he has done. He's put us to sleep. We can't have our sweat equity involved in the process. I'm done. I hope I've helped you. Because so many of God's people are so bound up in their thinking. And many church leaders, even around our city, use it as a tool to manipulate people. If you don't give, God can't bless you. and All this kind of nonsense. All the time. But we had a prophetic word earlier in the meeting, and it came directly to me. And someone said to me, and I thought, hey, this may be a moment for God just to demonstrate how he wants to heal you, restore you in this moment. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk back again to my spot, mess with the cameras a second time. <laughs> but I'm gonna say this to you, because some of you are sitting with struggles in your body, maybe you need to be healed. Maybe you need the healing of God. Maybe you need provision in your life and you don't have it. And you're thinking, am I doing something wrong? You're thinking transactionally. But why don't we step into a place of just walking with him? So maybe you're sitting in this space, say, God, please heal me. Please restore me. I need you to work with me. Then what I want you to do across this auditorium, for those that are sitting upstairs, I want, I want you to get out of your seats and walk forward to the, the rail. Kind of come, no, walk forward to the aisle. There's an aisle up there, I think. Yes, there is an aisle up there. Come walk forward. And for those of you in the room, says, God, I really need you to heal me. Come, come walk forward. Step out of the seat you're in and, and, and come stand with me here. And we, we're, gonna do some, we're gonna do some walking. You, come, God needs to heal you. There are people all over this place. I know, come, fill up the aisles. You can stand all the way to down there. We're just gonna fill this middle aisle, all the way to down that aisle down there. Stand up, move back into the aisle. Those in the front, move into the aisle. You're trusting for God's provision. You're trusting for God's healing. 
trusting for God and somehow you got yourself into that place, just fill the aisles. There's plenty of space. You don't need to come to me. You can just stand where you are, over there in the aisle. Come, come into the aisle, guys. Move that way a little bit, won't you? We need to fill the aisle that way. There we go. Come. Let's go. Come. People are filling the aisles everywhere. I need some space, so come, come back a little bit. Move in a little bit that way. We need some space over here where I'm standing. Thank you. Okay. All right. For those of you that are standing in the aisles further forward, go back a bit. Step back. We don't need you right in the front. You need to move. So this is what the Lord says today. You say, well, maybe I haven't, I don't know, maybe I haven't given enough. Maybe I haven't done enough to deserve his provision. Maybe I haven't prayed enough, sought his face enough. I don't know. And I may, I'm not, I'm just, maybe I'm not doing enough. I'm here to set you free today and say that you're a son and daughter of the living God. And he doesn't need your sweat equity to produce a miracle. He doesn't need you to do your thing and then he'll do his thing. It's not how relationship with God works. So what we're going to do today, very simply, is we're going to move up the one side of the mountain. We're going to walk. And we're going to trust that healing's coming up the other side, provision's coming up the other side. God knows. So, so walk with me. Come forward. Come down. All of you. Those up on the top, the, 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 the stairs on the ends will help you. Just walk down the stairs. Come. We've got to move. You can't stand still. Come. Let's go. Let's go. That's okay. You stay right there, sir. Walking will come to you. We're going to walk. Fill up the front. Don't worry. You can just come. Make space for people. Move as quick as you can. Because there's a lot of people coming behind you. Come. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You say, well, why is obedience important? Because it takes you where God can reveal his provision for you. So come, fill up the middle. Come in. Just pile in. Stand on the stage if there's no space. It's okay. You can stand anywhere. Ah, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. There's a need amongst your people, my Father. And so many have been caught into the trap of thinking, oh, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And now we can expect God to do his bit. He loves you. You're his son, you're his daughter. You belong to him. And he's saying, why don't you just walk with me? And we've demonstrated practically today in this room, we have walked, physically walked. And I want to say spiritually, on the other side of the mountain, the provision's coming up. And so, Father, right now, put your hands out in front of you. Say, Father, right now, whatever people are still moving, still walking, right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you for provision of healing. I thank you that there's a ram in the thicket. There is. There's, there's a provision waiting, sitting there. Because as we walked, as we move in obedience, God, you have brought up a provision for us. Whatever it is we need in the timing that you know, right now, in Jesus' name, we believe that, we receive that in Jesus' name, right now. Just receive it. Thank you, Jesus. I see the ram. I see it. There it is. There it is in faith. And it's mine. It's mine. Thank you, Father, for the obedience of your people. And thank you for the provision of God in every life finances, business, healing. In Jesus' name, break out over this place, Lord. Break out over this place that we would stop thinking so transactionally with you. We'd stop thinking that somehow we have not deserved what it is you want to give freely. And so, Father, right now, a wave of your life, a wave of your spirit, Wash over us. Bless us. As you so incredibly do, catch up and overtake us just in the back of the head almost. Just, just, we're just going to be surprised by how you bless us. 
in the next few days. We're going to be surprised this afternoon. Suddenly, we couldn't move that leg, and suddenly the leg moves, and we couldn't walk there, and suddenly we can walk there. Suddenly, you know, the provision wasn't there. Monday morning, suddenly something happens in our business, and stuff just happens. Why? Because blessing just comes up behind us and overtakes us because we are captivated by you, captivated by you. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said we will live from every word that comes from the mouth of God. When we taste from Him, we will never be hungry again. If you think of the word shared this morning, this is the living waters from the Lord Himself. We're not going to close our meeting in the same way that we normally do. So the official part of the meeting is now over. And if you would like to stay in the front, Joe, or we'll come forward for prayer, we're going to continue with ministering. But thank you so much for joining us. And God bless you. Amen.